What's good? J. Lucas Nutrition and Exercise Services here to bring you some information on creatine. I'm James Lucas, exercise physiologist, registered dietitian, and certified specialist in sports dietetics. Creatine, we know, is a very popular sports nutrition supplement and also very controversial. In many settings, we have different people considering taking creatine or either not taking creatine, either in the fitness industry or perhaps even for health purposes, it may have merit. We'll take a look at some of the research studies, some of the different information around creatine and its use. So first, for the outline, we'll cover what is creatine, we'll take a quick look at metabolism of creatine. We'll also look at how it works. We'll look at the different creatine types. How do you take it? What's the proper dosage? Side effects, potential side effects of creatine, ingestion, efficacy, health concerns, benefits of taking creatine, research studies, and safety. So first, what is creatine? Creatine is a naturally occurring nutrient that can be obtained in the diet from meat and fish. It can also be synthesized in the liver and pancreas from the amino acids arginine, glycerin, and methionine. It is also known as A-methylguaninoacetic acid. Creatine monohydrate or creatine to oxopropionate. Pretty tongue, uh, tongue twisted, uh, tying words. <laughs> creatine is a molecule in an energy system, creatine phosphate, that can rapidly produce energy, ATP, to support cellular function. Creatine is remarkably safe for most people and is a well-researched supplement. A lot of times what I notice is that People may have a misconception about creatine. I'm not exactly sure why. Maybe it was due to uh, Mark McGuire back in the day when he was taking creatine, and then all of a sudden it came out that he was taking steroids. You know, that kind of gave it a negative notion. And um, I think just the word itself, people not really knowing what exactly creatine is, etc., it gives people kind of a altered view of it. But you'll see that it actually has uh, many great benefits and very little side effects. So looking at creatine metabolism, we see that up to 94% of creatine is found in muscular tissues. And I would like to say that creatine metabolism is extremely complicated, but yet simple at the same time. Uh, so this here is just a, a general overview to give you a little picture of what creatine metabolism looks like. So we see uh, to the right in the picture major routes of creatine metabolism. From a dietary ingestion perspective, creatine can be absorbed from the small intestine and then it's taken up by the muscle tissue. Um, this uptake is reportedly not very simple because um, it's apparently going up against a large concentration gradient that's saturated by um, sodium and chloride uh, uh, for that sodium chloride dependent pathway. And I believe that creatine uses that same pathway, so it's not necessarily easy, you know, to get the creatine into that muscle tissue, which is why, um, from a su suggested intake perspective, it's recommended to take it with food. Um, that may help to increase the uptake of creatine. I'm thinking potentially through that um, insulin-dependent pathway, or I believe what's called GP4. So when you take the creatine with protein and carbohydrates, that increases insulin, which increases the number of porters um, into the muscle tissue to increase that uh, creatine content within the muscle tissue. So the daily demand for creatine is met either by intestinal absorption of creatine from the diet or by de novo creatine biosynthesis. So creatine can be created through, through the um, kidneys, through um, amino acids, arginine, and glycerin, and then it's um, taken up by a mechanism in the liver, 
when creatine, creatine can be created and then transported to the muscle tissue as well. So the first step of creatine biosynthesis probably occurs mainly in the kidney, whereas the liver is likely to be the principal organ accomplishing the subsequent methylation of guanidoacetic acid, GAA, to creatine. And um, additionally, muscle has virtually no creatine synthesizing capacity, which is why it's important to consider creatine supplementation in order to get an additional um, athletic benefit. And uh, that storage of creatine varies between one person and another. And uh, we'll see further, depending on the type of diet you follow, that can have an influence on the amount of creatine that's stored over time. Okay. So next, how creatine works. Fossil creatine and creatine provide a vital reservoir of energy that is used to replenish ATP, adenosine triphosphate, during high-intensity exercise. During high-intensity anaerobic exercise lasting 5 to 15 seconds, muscles rely on stores of phosphocreatine to resynthesize ATP. Once these stores become depleted, the body is forced to rely on other forms of metabolism for ATP, causing performance to decline. So that high-intensity exercise that we uh, do, say, when sprinting or lifting weights um, at a higher intensity calls upon that ATP source of energy, which is why if we can increase that storage of creatine, it will help to uh, replenish that store of um, phosphate so that we can continue exercising at a high level of intensity for a longer period of time. So supplementation increases storage of phosphocreatine, allowing muscle to work at higher intensities for a longer time. There's a lot of different creatine types out there. Um, for example, creatine HCL, creatine ethyl ester, creatine pyruvate, creatine magnesium, creatine anhydrous, creatine alpha ketoglutarate, creatine phosphate, effervescent creatine. But the gold standard is creatine monohydrate, period. So when you're supplementing, make sure that you're choosing that creatine monohydrate product as it is the gold standard and has been well known to be a gold standard for a long period of time. How to take creatine. Take 5 grams per day if you have average muscle mass, if you're more like an ectomorph or an uh, endomorph. But if you have a larger muscle mass, you're more of a mesomorph, you want to take a larger dose, perhaps 10 grams per day. You want to take it with adequate fluids and food to increase uptake and absorption. <clears throat> Avoid drinking with coffee as that can block creatine uptake. Also, you don't have to cycle creatine. You can take it indefinitely. I remember back in the day when I was in high school, guys would consider cycling creatine, which back then it kind of made sense because people were like, oh, you know, it could affect your liver and kidneys and, you know, all these different things they weren't sure. Uh, but, but now they're showing that you can take creatine long term indefinitely and it wouldn't have any effect on um, side effects or any uh, markers of uh, risk. So creatine monohydrate is the cheapest and most effective form of creatine, as mentioned. And um, if you want to find something that mixes easier, try the micronized creatine so that it can dissolve easily in water. So looking at creatine dosing, it is advised that athletes use a loading protocol for the most immediate effect, which involves consuming 0.3 grams of creatine per kilogram of body weight or 0.25 grams per kilogram of fat-free mass. That's if you actually made an assessment for your fat-free mass, you know, had a DEXA scan, underwater weighing, something like that. Most people don't know what their fat-free mass is for three to five days, followed by a dose of three to five grams of creatine per day thereafter, long-term. Creatine uptake is improved when consumed in combination with protein and carbohydrate, as, as mentioned. During loading, doses should be separated into four to five smaller servings consumed throughout the day. I'm not particularly a big fan of this one, but if you want to get more immediate effects within, say, like a two-week time frame, um, you might want to consider doing this small, I'm sorry, uh, small dosages um, throughout the day for maybe one to two weeks and then follow up with a uh, maintenance dose of five grams of creatine per day, of which you can take it either pre- or post-workout. 
A longer term strategy of consuming 46 grams of creatine per day, either pre or post workout, is also effective. But as mentioned, it, you won't see it as an immediate effect. So, again, looking at creatine dosing, uh, the average exerciser, someone, you know, they're not uh, doing a lot of high intensity activity, but, you know, you're going to the gym here and there, you got an average body size, you can take five grams daily. If you got more muscle mass, you're more mesomorph, larger, thicker body type, you might want to consider going with uh, 10 grams daily to get a greater benefit of creatine because you have more muscle, you have more reservoir to store creatine. And then sometimes you have someone that doesn't really respond to the creatine. Um, they might have um, a higher baseline level of creatine in the muscle. Um, you know, continue, consider taking it with protein and carbohydrate pre or post workout. So creatine side effects, um, what are some of the true potential side effects to the left? Nausea, stomach cramping, and diarrhea, which I have never experienced any, and I've been taking creatine for years. When you supplement larger doses of creatine, so up to 20 grams per day, acutely, without sufficient water. The other side effects is weight gain. There's no other side effects that are known from taking uh, creatine. And studies, as we'll see, have been done for up to five years with consistent creatine intake. However, what we usually see, say, in the news or from colleagues or healthcare professionals that have not done the research, we see anecdotal side effects like, oh, it causes dehydration, muscle cramping, increased risk for musculoskeletal injuries, GI distress, renal stress, or liver function, or liver dysfunction, or restlessness when taking an hour before sleep. I can even remember... Back when I was in high school, you know, I, I was taking it like maybe my senior year of uh, high school. And my, my track coach, you know, he's a great guy, but he was like, oh, you know, you're taking that creatine, it'll burn up your liver. You know, when, when the liver is actually designed to utilize and create, you know, creatine, as we noted, from metabolism based upon the byproducts from, from the kidney, that's when you're not taking in enough dietary creatine, which we know that dietary creatine doesn't even go through the liver it goes from the from the GI tract to the muscle tissue so creatine efficacy scientific research has proven that supplementation with creatine results in a 10 to 40 percent increase in fossil creatine stores without a doubt when you take creatine it has been shown to increase the fossil creatine storage without a doubt so athletes who consume diets low in meat and fish who are vegetarian typically see the highest increases because we can get that creatine again naturally from those meat and fish sources, but you would have to eat a lot more say, to get 5 grams of creatine per day in order for it to be ergogenic, where it's going to provide you with the performance benefit. Short-term supplementation has been shown to improve maximal strength and power by 5 to 15 percent, single effort strength performance 1 to 5 percent, and work performed during multiple sets of maximum strength training or sprinting 5 to 15 percent. In addition, long term creatine supplementation can improve the training effects by 5 to 15 percent, improving gains in strength power and lean body mass. Kreider, he's done a lot of research on uh, creatine, very intelligent individual. I recommend doing some YouTube searches if you want to dive deeper and become more versed on creatine. So, creatine and health. Creatine is considered safe despite speculation that it negatively affects renal function. Creatine has also been scrutinized because of a lack of long-term research. However, long-term use has been studied up to five years. Recent evidence suggests creatine may provide additional health benefits in the treatment of a broad range of diseases, including neurodegenerative disorders, cancer, rheum rheumatic diseases, and type 2 diabetes. It may also improve cognitive function in the elderly. I'm telling you, mark my words now, we're going to see more products with creatine in it as more studies come out. Um, I've been a fan of creatine for so long, but yeah, I'm still seeing that many are fearful um, about taking creatine, uh, despite a lot of the research that has been conducted. Creatine benefits. Creatine can produce small but immediate effects on maximum strength and power. Creatine allows athletes to repeatedly perform maximum bouts of speed, strength, and power resulting in improved performance and an enhanced training effect. 65 studies show an increase in power output. This is one of the greatest benefits of creatine intake. A 12 to 20% improvement in strength has been noted 
and a 12 to 26 percent increase in power following a training regimen using creatine monohydrate. We'll look at some other potential benefits of creatine. What we see that is that there may be an improvement in hydration, anaerobic running capacity, lean body mass, reduced fatigue, reduced blood glucose, particularly postprandial spikes in blood glucose reduction by 11 to 22 percent, minor bone mineral density increase, a minor effect. This is all coming from examine.com. Uh, reduced muscle damage, moderate. Uh, increased muscular endurance, minor increase in testosterone, treatment of myotonic dystrophy, minor effect in um, the DM2 version, um, a minor increase in VO2 max. <clears throat> Noticing that there's a very high improvement in um, symptoms of depression as creatine appears to enhance SSRI therapy. Also can help support glycogen resynthesis, a notable increase. Increased cognition in vegetarians, uh, minor. Decreased DNA, man I'm sorry, decreased DNA damage, minor. Treatment of headaches, uh, notable. So looking at creatine safety, what are some of the latest studies on creatine and safety or some studies that have been conducted? You see by um, Mayhew and um, colleagues, published in the International Journal of Sports Medicine, 2002. Long-term creatine intake amongst Division I football players. They provided 5 to 20 grams of creatine per day for five years in Division I football players. There was no significant effect on liver or kidney function. The conclusion was that there was no long-term side effects in trained athletes besides weight gain. And dehydration was reported only in athletes who didn't consume enough fluids with supplementation. Looking at creatine safety again, Kreider, once again, um, published a study in molecular and cellular biology. They administered 15.75 grams for five days and then 5 to 10 grams of creatine per day for 21 months following training sessions. 98 athletes were included. And there was also a non-creatine group, so 98 athletes took the product. Neither group demonstrated any changes in blood or urine markers. So they found that even the group taking the creatine, they had no changes compared to those who did not. So showing that the creatine does not affect those blood or urine markers. Also looking here, a uh, study by Tarnopolsky et al., 2004 neurology, creatine and muscular dystrophy. 30 boys with muscular dystrophy, 50% taking corticosteroids. Creatine monohydrate was provided at 0.1 grams per kilogram per day. They noted that there was an improvement in hand grip strength and fat free mass in the creatine monohydrate group with no side effects. <clears throat> corticosteroids can actually cause muscle breakdown, and with muscular dystrophy, you want to maintain muscle. So uh, here we see that an improvement in hand grip strength and fat free mass helps to support those parameters. Another creatine and safety study uh, looking here at um, creatine and um, acute lymphoblastic leukemia type of cancer. 0.1 grams of creatine per kilogram per day were provided for two 16 week periods. There were 16 weeks of creatine ingestion with six weeks of washout and then another 16 weeks of creatine ingestion. This group here that took in about 6.8 grams of creatine, save for someone that was 150 pounds. There was no side effects in this study. Here we have another study looking at creatine and traumatic brain injury in kids. Uh, creatine and uh, traumatic brain injuries is being more extensively studied. More research studies are coming out. There's one currently being conducted, from what I've heard, at, say, TCU University. Um, so we'll be excited to see what that looks like. Uh, they're giving really high doses from what I hear. And we see uh, 39 kids with TBI between the ages of 1 to 18 years old receiving 0.4 grams per kilogram per day of creatine for 6 months. That's about 27 grams of creatine per day. So generally, just based on this here study, we can see that the creatine dose needed to provide that potential benefit to brain health after a brain injury is going to be much higher 
than what you would take for, say, muscular performance. So they demonstrated benefits of post-traumatic amnesia, uh, duration of intubation, intensive care unit stay, disability, good recovery, self-care, communication, locomotion, sociability, personal behavior, and neurophysical and cognitive function. And so overall, greater outcomes with no side effects. We have another study looking at creatine in youth athletes, uh, 16 male swimmers. They provided four 5-gram dosages of creatine per day in five days versus placebo. They found that there was an increase in power output looking at rebound jumps, a 20.2% improvement in rebound jumps, no side effects. Creatine safety, looking at creatine in relation to youth athletes, 19 male soccer players. They provided 0 0.03 grams of creatine per kilogram body weight for 14 days. And then they um, looked, that was about 2 grams per day of creatine, a really low dose. Um, studies show that 2 grams per kilogram, 2 grams of creatine uh, per day is not going to really give much benefit. But in these little young athletes here, they did see a significant increase in peak power and mean power in the creatine supplemented group versus the placebo. They didn't measure any markers of kidney or liver function. In this one, I mean, this 2017, perhaps they felt it wasn't necessary, but I guess ultimately to eliminate that potential factor, um, you know, it's probably recommended that more studies in the future continually look at those measures so that that concern about safety can be totally eliminated. So looking at creatine variables now, should you take creatine? Is it right for you? No, you don't have to. I'm sure there's plenty of jack dudes in the gym, you know, people that have uh, been working out for long term or just performing and sprinting without taking creatine. Um, it's something that you could potentially experiment with if you would like. Um, ultimately, these um, supplements are out there to provide that potential ergogenic benefit. Uh, you know, an ergogenic aid is anything that can help to enhance performance. It could be anything from uh, the, the, the sneakers you wear to, um, you know, modifying the food that you eat or providing yourself with a certain type of clothing to enhance performance. So if you decide to take creatine for that ergogenic benefit, that's up to you. But you just want to make sure that you keep some things in mind. Take a, a risk-benefit assessment. I mean, the, the risk is, is typically low from what we see about utilizing high-quality creatine monohydrate-based product. But if you're an athlete, you want to be careful that you're not taking a product that might be adulterated with banned substances because companies can mix creatine in with other uh, products and ingredients. You also want to be mindful about how much, how, <clears throat> excuse me, how much you take at one time. Stick to the dosage recommendations. Don't take more than the suggested dosage. That's when you start running into problems. More than when you, when you take more, I'm sorry, more than too much of anything isn't good for you. That's what I meant to say. So be mindful of that. How could you potentially reduce the risk of having an adulterated product? Stick with those NSF certified. Um, Products tested by third parties, you know, like NSF certified products, or check informed choice to make sure the product has been checked for what's in it. Also, the NCAA does prohibit its member schools from giving creatine and other muscle building supplements to athletes, although it doesn't ban athletes from using it on their own. So that's it on creatine from J. Lucas Nutrition. Stay tuned for additional topics on supplementation, health, and meeting your fitness goals, exercise tips, etc. I do provide nutrition counseling, meal plans. I can help to improve your athletic performance. I can give you supplement recommendations. I could also provide you with uh, tips and suggestions for weight loss, lean body mass gains, and improving your overall health and wellness. Shoot me a text message or send me an email for free tips and advice. J. Lucas Nutrition and Exercise Services. Make the right nutrition choices today to influence your health for tomorrow.